Hi, everyone. Welcome to Cal Matters and our latest edition of Getting Through Coronavirus Explained. My name is Vanessa Richardson. I am Deputy Editor of Events for Cal Matters. For those of you tuning in for the first time, just a brief intro about us. Cal Matters is a nonprofit, nonpartisan newsroom based in Sacramento, and we're committed to explaining California policy and politics and how it affects you and your life. Right now, our reporters and editors are following how the coronavirus pandemic is affecting California policy and politics, and of course, it's 40 million residents. So along with our nonstop reporting, we're doing a special series of interviews called Getting Through Coronavirus Explained, in which our team of Cal Matters reporters sit down and talk with California policymakers and professionals who are tasked with getting us through this pandemic. This week, we're doing an Education Explained series on how California schools, kindergarten all the way to higher education, are adjusting to the current situation. Yesterday, we had a live stream here about K-12 public schools. Today, we're going to hear from uh, California State University Chancellor Tim White about how the nation's largest public four-year university system is responding to the coronavirus pandemic, still tripping over that one, and the shift to online learning that's underway at its 23 campuses. Your Cal Matters host today is Felicia Mello. She covers higher education for Cal Matters, and she's also editor of the Cal Matters College Journalism, Journalism Network. That is a new collaboration between, oh, let me just scroll down here. I have notes. I want to make sure I got it right. Let's see, it's a new collaboration. Sorry, bear with me. I'm scrolling down on my docs. Okay, it's called Cal Matters College Journalism Network, and it's a collaboration between Cal Matters and student journalists around the state, and they have just launched a blog called Corona on Campus, and you can find it at calmatters.org. Also joining Felicia is our one of her student journalists, Aiden McGloin. She is a reporter with the Mustang News at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. All right, and I'm still scrolling down to the rest of my notes because I have just a few more things before I pass the mic over. Uh, for you who are watching on YouTube right now, we want you to be part of this conversation as well. Yesterday's live stream chat was a really good one because we got a lot of great questions from the audience and they also listed great resources and websites for students and teachers to check out. And one of them also gave us a potentially good title to put on all the things we're doing right now, Civics on Steroids. So I want to shout out to Marcy Guthrie for giving us that slogan. So please help us make today's conversation an interesting one and a useful one by submitting your questions to us. You just type them into the chat box on the right-hand side of the YouTube screen. Felicia and Aiden will ask their questions along with yours. And before I turn it over to them, I want to list a few ways you can keep track of our reporting and events like we're doing today. Sign up for our daily newsletter, What Matters. You can subscribe to this YouTube channel. And to our podcast hub at SoundCloud, we also record these for audio podcasts. And consider becoming a Cal members member or donor to help us keep doing our nonprofit, nonpartisan journalism and our civics on steroids, especially now during these very unsettled and unpredictable times. All the information you need to do that is on our website, calmatters.org. And with that, I'm turning the mic over to Felicia and Aiden. Thanks, Vanessa. And thank you, Chancellor, for being with us today. So California college students have really been hit with a one-two punch this spring. They're adjusting to learning online because the coronavirus has shut down in-person classes across the state. And at the same time, like the rest of us, they're coping with all of the many ways that this pandemic is disrupting their lives. Most are now living off campus, figuring out how to study in rooms that are crowded with anxious family members and housemates. Some are still living in the dorms because they don't have other options and they're doing their best to keep themselves safe. And like thousands of other Californians, some students are also losing their jobs, which they rely on to help pay for their education. Of the states, some 3 million college students, more than 480,000 attend California State University. And CSU faculty are also adapting to teaching online, many for the first time. Chancellor White, you've postponed your retirement to steer the university through this crisis. What are the major things CSU has accomplished so far in responding to this pandemic? And what's the biggest challenge that you're dealing with right now? Well, thank you. Yes, I did 
I did uh, suspend my uh, retirement. I, in, in a lighthearted moment, say I failed retirement before I even started it this time around. Um, but you know, when I decided to step down, it was things were going very well, and obviously the this global pandemic of historic proportions, uh, the, really a global disaster, has changed that. And so I'm, I and others have decided to continue in our leadership roles. Presidents of the East Bay campus in Northridge, uh, Leroy Marista and Diane Harrison, have also agreed to stay in the in the leadership seat for six months beyond when they too were planning to retire. And the reason for doing so is we care so deeply about the core function and mission of the CSU. And I'm and I want to be very clear to those who are listening that um, and we're being guided as, at this moment by our values of ensuring the health and safety of our students and our employees, our faculty and staff, but also coupled with that steadfast commitment to student achievement and to success, in, indeed our inclusive excellence uh, and graduation initiative efforts. And so we're in a good position in the CSU from the point of view that we really are inspired by the sense of care and compassion and community and common sense. It's really is part of the fabric of the, the DNA, if you will, of the California State Universities top to bottom, left to right among our students and our employees. Um, we are open for business, but we are open virtually. And uh, yes, students and faculty and staff have all pivoted uh, in very short order. We've been doing everything we can to help train faculty who had not been conversant with uh, this technology to come online. Uh, we're accepting things that aren't perfect and trying to make them better every day. So, you know, we're flying a new ship, uh, building a new ship as we're flying it. But uh, I, I do want to emphasize that we are very committed to letting our students uh, complete their coursework this term. And as we look through the summer and fall, we'll make progress to degrees. It's unfortunate that we had to postpone commencement ceremonies and some of those things that are, are great uh, achievement uh, events. But nonetheless, the educational part continues forward uh, in a different format, but unabated. So we've collected questions from readers in advance of this conversation, and many, many students wrote in asking about refunds. Uh, we know that some students who have uh, left the dorms got refunds on some of the fees that they paid for housing, room and board. Um, but students are asking whether they'll receive a refund of fees they've paid for on-campus services like gyms and healthcare now that they're largely not using those services. Does the university have any plans to do this? And, and will you be charging those fees for the summer session if uh, students are still studying remotely? Yeah, so when it comes to, to the fees, I mean, I would certainly acknowledge and understand the financial angst and realities that many people are feeling. So with respect to our student workers, we right away guaranteed that they would continue to be paid um, uh, through April 5th at whatever they were working 10 hours or 15 or 20 hours a week uh, in any part of the university or auxiliaries. We committed to continue their, their compensation, even if they had to work remotely or if they were basically their job disappeared because something closed down. Um, we also have put in place an administrative leave policy that affects our student employees as well, which allows them going forward to uh, earn up to 126 hours of pay, again, at their normal fractional rate. They're working half time. They could earn another 126 hours of pay, even if they can't come and do their jobs. So the first point here is I get it. <laughs> I get it, what it is to be living on the margin, and I get what it means to uh, to be looking at a situation where you may lose your uh, income, even a small income that our students earn, it's vital to, to keep them on the right side. When it comes to fees, um, yes, indeed, the, the fees that are associated with um, parking uh, for students uh, with respect to meal plans in the residence hall and with respect to the residence halls themselves, all of the campus will have a refund policy for those areas and uh, have have provided refunds. But as you point out, for many of our students, staying in the residence halls is the very best and safest place for them to be. And so it's been very interesting to me to see that that uh, there's a couple hundred students left in, let's, I'm making up the number now, let's say in a series of residence halls that could hold a thousand. 
we've now spread those students out. So we have the physical distancing. They may have been in a room with one or two other uh, roommates. They're now all in single rooms. So we're doing the physical distancing while letting them stay in the residence halls. Uh, so we're proud of the nimbleness of the campuses doing that. When it comes to some of the other fees, uh, such as the health centers, you know, those health centers are still open to people by appointment and are also open to people by calling in for advice and counseling. And so some of those mandatory fees that cover recreation centers or health centers uh, will not be refunded uh, because we either have a sort of a mortgage payment that everybody is used to when we built the recreation center and students, whether they use it or not, we're all part of helping fund that. Uh, things like the health centers, however, are open. They're just open in a different way. And so we're trying to make certain that the fees that support the delivery of instruction and the academic support and the health support of our students, those fees will remain. Those that can be refunded are mainly in the areas of, of parking, of food, and in residence homes. Thank you. And I wanted to follow up on one thing because you mentioned um, that student workers were continuing to be paid. And I know we've been hearing some reports from student workers that are not working directly for the university, but are working for some of those auxiliary services on campus who have um, either been laid off or, or had their hours cut. Um, how, what's CSU's policy on this? Are you working with your contractors on it? And how are you helping those students? Yeah, this is a really difficult issue, to be very honest. Um, you know, we cannot use state of California funds to pay the salary of a student who was employed by an auxiliary uh, enterprise uh, on a campus. Some of those auxiliaries have some degree of reserves and are able to keep people on the payroll, both student employees as well as full-time employees. But others uh, are revenue dependent, such as a, a, a store, for example, which sells the university's brand where the Long Beach State has here in Long Beach a store. And there's been 23 employees there, full-time employees and over 600 student workers because that store is closed. There's no revenue to support them. So the harshness is for the auxiliaries is there is a different capability to maintain employees on the payroll. Now those that lose those jobs will be eligible for um, unemployment insurance through the state of California. But it is important to notice that this CARES Act that is still murky with respect to its details has some provisions in there, which our Office of General Counsel has been working 24 seven to try and figure out where it may very well be the case that we can get uh, resources out of the CARES Act that can come to these nonprofit auxiliaries and enable the support, including payroll, of individuals in those auxiliaries. Now, the devil's going to be in the details. It at first appears to be that this would be a loan. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you, as we're analyzing the fine print, it means that as long as people don't lose their job, that loan gets forgiven. It really becomes a grant. And that's going to be true for the smaller uh, auxiliaries with less than perhaps 500 employees. Whereas for the larger auxiliaries, if they have more than 500 employees, there may very well be a loan availability, but that would ultimately have to be paid back. And so here's a wonderful example of how our attorneys and our business and finance people, with the eye of being committed to our students and our employees, are turning every stone to find places that have revenues generated to be able to support their, their, their positions and their, uh, their wages and maintain their benefits during this otherwise disastrous moment in time. Um, so that's a work in progress. We'll have more details as, as the federal government. They've had a couple of webinars and they've turned out to be uh, self-congratulatory webinars rather than helpful webinars about how this is actually gonna work. Uh, there are some national bodies who've been looking at the CARES Act, uh, the uh, uh, ACE and uh, ASCU, two of the ones that are big for the CSU along with APLU. And, and we see quite a few resources coming, not only to support, potentially support the auxiliaries, but also to help support our students who are low income and the operations of our universities as well. Felicia, I lost you, you went uh, mute.
Can you hear me? I cannot hear either Felicia or Aiden. I have a question from uh, Virginia Durovich, who's a professor from Domingos Hills. I teach a class that meets for three hours once a week. I can't just make that into a three hour online class. What does the educational research show about best practices for online classes? Yeah, it's a really wonderful question. And, and in some respects, you know, uh, if you have a three hour face-to-face -face moment and the class has some lecture and some discussion and some demonstrations, and I'm making that up because I don't know specifically what the, the discipline is that she teaches. Uh, when you use technology, uh, sometimes then with the chat box, it doesn't take you 30 minutes to have a discussion. It only takes three or four or five minutes to have that discussion because people can be at asking and answering side conversations during the course of the lecture. So I think part of this is the flexibility that we all have to have is, you know, contact hours. How do we define them going forward in this virtually assisted world compared to the traditional seat time world? And I think that's a work in progress. I, I think the best practice shows, however, that any engagement uh, and the ability to interact with students to answer questions and to appreciate their difficulties, both academically as well as personally, that sense of caring, that empathy, that compassion goes a long ways in making a very remarkable um, learning environment. I, I, I did learn from a, a, a woman who is a, a Laura Ars. Uh, she's Dr. Ars is a lecturer of biological sciences and directs the Research Careers Preparatory Program at Cal State Fullerton. And, and she was uh, said something around that I had a chance to read. It said that she's at home, and, quote, and I'm going to quote this. I moved my furniture around to accommodate a workspace, and I just went live. I decided I would allow myself not to be perfect. And that's a really important point here. Let's, let's be perfect on our intent, but maybe not perfect on our execution, because we'll figure this stuff out. But being good but not perfect is hard for an A-type personality, according to Dr. Ars, which is no slack what we are. But we care, and we have lots of knowledge to give to our students. And I think that's the thing to take is a deep breath. Don't worry about being perfect. Think about the things that really matter to our students, the content, the engagement, the understanding of their life circumstances, and their ability to interact either by asking questions or by chat boxes or by email or by phone calls to feel like they're part of something. And it's going to work OK. It's different, but it's going to work OK. One of the aspects of this is that a lot of these classes are intended to be lab. And when you have that lab component be moved and tend to be a lecture component, then that's a long lecture. Um, how can we adapt these lab courses to be online when there's so much difficulty in putting it this physical need into a virtual setting. Yes, I mean, I agree. I don't think that, that all of the, um, uh, from the, from the hands on the laboratory parts of our courses, you know, if you are uh, uh, an astrophysics major and you're in your senior capstone class and the project is to build a rocket and shoot it off out in the desert up to 10,000 feet, you know, that's pretty difficult to do virtually with that same hands-on experience. But all of the components that go into that rocket building in terms of uh, thrust and resistance and weight distribution, you know, all that stuff can be modeled. It, I recall when I was on the faculty at, at Berkeley back in the 1990s, I taught a muscle plasticity class where we were very primitively trying to put together some models to talk about uh, how the thick and thin filaments and skeletal muscle, the myosin and actin and interact, and sort of like rowing a boat, how they work at a micromotor level. And we created some very primitive videos that, uh, in looking back, are embarrassingly embarrassing, just put it that way. But they were effective at the moment. And subsequent to that, in the, in the world of uh, skeletal muscle uh, biology, uh, are all these amazing now simulation labs of what happens to a muscle if you lengthen it or injure it or shorten it or or, or it trains uh, through exercise, et cetera, or it faces disease. And I think we're going to see an absolute proliferation 
And much of this, I think, will be done by our students in creating simulated experiences that are so real. Uh, think about the gaming industry and how, how people of all ages can get hooked and engrossed in the gaming industry with, a, with, with what is not real but seems real. And I think what we're going to see now that we've taken this rapid pivot to using technology and learning is a proliferation by very smart people in creating simulations that provide the same level of knowledge and the same experience and allow people to earn credit not only in that course, but with their degree, with a degree that matters for the industry they're interested in going in. We're at the very beginning of that, and I think it's going to be a remarkably exciting time, to be honest with you. And if I was smart enough and young enough and smart enough in the IT space, I'd be working on something right now. As far as um, we don't have laptops or reliable home internet, or in general, uh, have difficulty accessing online classes, um, what is the CFU doing to ensure that these students um, will receive the education that they are paying for? And how much of an issue is this among CFU students? Yeah, you know, it is, it is a, a deep concern, and it's often students who come from the first in their families to go off to college, which are so many of our students, as well as coming from low income. And oftentimes, they, these are, are folks of color. Um, so what the campuses have been doing is, is loaning out uh, iPads, Chromebooks, laptops, desktop, whatever they could to students uh, and staff to take home. One campus uh, actually gave all the uh, laptops to staff to be able to work remotely and then realized they have a whole bunch of desktops but, and the students can't use the desktops. So now they're asking staff to bring the laptops back. They get sanitized and then the staff takes the desktop home and the student gets the laptop. Uh, some campuses were seeing this company coming and ordered several hundred new uh, devices and uh, has made those available. They've been loaning out hotspots. Uh, we've had to close the computer labs or some campuses where there was a common space where you could come and use, a, uh, use an institutional computer. At first we did the physical distancing, but soon realized that wasn't sufficient because it was creating congregations. And we have to do our piece in flattening this curve and preventing the probability of disease transmission. So this week, we, at the beginning of this week, we closed all of those common spaces. But several campuses now have had the IT folks create in the parking structures or in the open lots, Wi-Fi enabled areas that previously weren't Wi-Fi. So a student could come to campus in her car with some device and sit in that parking lot and fully connect. Even if where they live, there is no bandwidth to connect if they're living coming in from an area that is low in bandwidth. So it's these sorts of efforts. We're continuing to try and buy and distribute more of these devices. Some of the companies have made deals available to students as well. And again, I think in this CARES Act, there's going to be a lot of resources that come to campuses of which half of those resources are going to be given to low-income students. And if you look at the CARES Act, uh, uh, depending on the size of the campus and depending on how many students they have that are low income is, is indexed by Pell, uh, our smallest campus will be getting about a million, $1.2 million from the CARES Act. And one of our larger campuses, several are up well above $40 million, maybe even $45 or $46 million. Those are, those are estimates, so they're not fact yet. But if half of that money is going to low income students, that's going to be a tremendous boost for them to be able to buy or sign into technology that they otherwise couldn't afford. So while there is some turbulence and white water we're going through right now as all of this stuff is working out, I ask for a patience and, and, and commitment to the purpose, both by students and by our staff and faculty. We'll get through the white water and the rough patch, and then we'll be back in, in, in a much more vibrant circumstance. And, and I'm I'm actually bullish on the future, even though it's dramatically different at the CSU. Chancellor, we had a couple questions from faculty. Um, one, uh, 
Will the CSU help faculty pay for things like home internet and other technical infrastructure that they have to set up in order to teach online? And um, will assistant professors have an extension on their tenure clocks if the research that they're doing is interrupted by the pandemic? Yeah, so when it comes to the uh, added costs uh, of, of do, working for home, I think that probably is a work in progress um, in the sense that if they had to go buy some instrumentation because they they couldn't have something, they couldn't they have a shared office and they couldn't take it home. I think those things will get worked out in time. The idea of uh, increased use of electricity and some of the smaller costs of working from home, I don't think there's going to be any refunds for that or stipends for that amount because, quite frankly, people are saving money on not driving their cars anymore. So, you know, if your electricity bill goes up uh, 10 bucks a, a month uh, because you're working from home, you know, that's like what three gallons of gas. And I suspect we're saving there. So I, I do know that uh, the campuses will be working through for any genuine, authentic out-of-pocket costs in order to do this, uh, but that's uh, going to be worked out much more at the local level. And then you're, you're uh, ask me the other question again, because it came in and out of my head and I lost it. Sure, about uh, tenure clocks, whether they will be paused if folks have their research interrupted by the pandemic. Yeah, we don't want to have temporary uh, uh, barriers that are coming from the circumstance to get in the way of student achievement or of professional development. And I think, you know, I know, for example, uh, in, in other times, if uh, a faculty member is giving birth to a child, that we would often have a year's delay in when, when the tenure clock is working as they attend to those early childhood days. So I think something similar to that will be, and we're not going to let this pandemic hurt the professional careers of people. Uh, but we haven't gotten to those level of details yet. We've been managing the day-to-day -day, uh, never ending set of policy questions around, around human resources, around the legal issues, around our financial issues and the delivery of classes and student services. We will get to the issues or, that you just raised about tenure clocks and things of that nature in a way that's fair to people. I think. Well, one of the things here is Let's be reasonable, let's be fair, but let's also all be committed to finding the right way forward together. So we've been talking a bit about the CARES Act and for folks who don't know, that's the $2 trillion uh, stimulus package that the federal government has passed that has some $14 billion in it for colleges and universities nationwide. Um, some of that, as Chancellor White said, is anticipated will come to California colleges and universities. Um, but I also wanted to just ask about other financial resources that, that the university might have on hand. Um, last year, a state audit found that the university has about $1.5 billion in reserves. I guess my question is kind of twofold. How big of a financial hit is the university taking right now? And have you had to dip into those reserves? And then secondly, could those reserves serve as a pot of money to fund things like emergency aid for students that that are struggling in this crisis? Yeah, it's a wonderfully important question. So uh, the uh, the CARES Act, I think, will be helpful both to our students, uh, low income students, and also to our university operations. And we're you know, we've been working with our elected leaders back uh, back in Washington to try and expedite the release of those dollars. From a practical point of view, I don't an anticipate any checks in the mail for another you know, three or four weeks, uh, just the way bureaucracies work. But once we determine how much is coming, then we can start sort of thinking about how to invest that most wisely. In our Graduation Initiative 2025 program, which isn't going away, by the way, is, is part and parcel of our DNA. There are uh, opportunities for many grants and emergency grants in that in that set. Um, the College Futures Foundation under the leadership of uh, Monica Lozano is coordinating a statewide uh, philanthropic response to address the emergency needs of low-income college students. And those will all be uh, $500 grants and that fund is starting to grow and, and people can apply for it, make the case that they have. Uh, we are dipping into our reserves if 
as you recall, there were three basic buckets. One bucket was for facilities and deferred maintenance issues. Uh, another bucket was for um, uh, a true rainy day reserve, and those are being spent down a little bit in part to help buy some of these extra laptops and Wi-Fi connections and things of that nature. We also have to be looking to the future. Um, you know, we do not know. The assumptions that the Governor Newsom has for our budget for the next year, uh, and just to just back up for one second, we always submit, the trustees submit a request in November. The governor puts out a preliminary budget in January. Then we get to the May revise, and then the budget actually gets implemented traditionally uh, right in, in June. Well, this unmitigated disaster is going to change all of the assumptions and all of the timing about our budget for next year. Obviously, they delayed uh, income tax uh, collections for up to 90 days uh, with a number of jobless requirements. The hit on unemployment insurance is going up through the roof. Um, and the list goes on and on and on. So I anticipate that we're going to, at the university, going to have a very serious financial challenge, certainly in the next fiscal year, which begins July 1. But it isn't even out of the question that we may be challenged by our general fund support during this remaining two or three months of this fiscal year. But part of the responsibility of having reserves is to have them when you absolutely have to use them. So it would be it would be malpractice for us to spend down our reserves today with all of this uncertainty that's facing us in the weeks, months, and years ahead. Uh, we don't know. Uh, we hope that it doesn't, but we do not know uh, if we're going to have a significant reduction in the number of students who continue their education next year because we don't know what the pandemic is going to look like a month or two from now yet. So we have to keep some of our reserves for those unknown but inevitable moments. We're planning to not have the, you know, the governor's January uh, appropriation increase for us was pegged at a $199 million increase in our, in our general fund budget. We're not counting on that anymore. We're counting on a zero or maybe even a takeaway. And then we don't know about the numbers of students, and therefore we don't know about for those who do pay tuition uh, and fees what that's going to look like. So our finance people on every campus are doing a liquidity uh, and cash flow analyses under a whole set of circumstances. What does it look like if we, you know, get this amount of money for the state or this amount of money for the state, or get cut? What does it look like if we lose uh, 2% of our student body or if we lose 5% or 10%? You know, how do those scenarios look to us from the business point of view? Because we have employees to pay and benefits to pay and mortgage payments, if you will, debt service on so many of our facilities and repairs. So there's a lot going on on the business side of the university. I don't want our students or our employees to be worrying about that as I am and our staff are but I want people to know that that level of analysis is happening as we think about what the future is going to look like and how we're going to continue to provide a world-class education in a dramatically different financial environment and learning environment. Uh, we, we will succeed. It's just hard to give you specifics at this point in time. So grading policies have also been a concern during this crisis. UC Berkeley has defaulted to pass-fail grades, and there are petitions circulating on a number of campuses um, calling for more flexible grading policies. Lincoln Baum from Chico State wants to know if you plan to make some sort of policy that gives students an easier time on the grading this semester. And Ashley Kendricks at Fresno State asks, will you consider pass-fail grading for the spring 2020 semester? Yeah, so I think it's uh, four or five days ago uh, after a consultation with uh, academic senate and student leaders and with campus leaders, we put together a, a set of policies on how to go forward with respect to grading in this current term. And, uh, uh, and so we have all of 21 of our campuses are on semesters and two campuses are on quarters. Uh, and so things get, you know, one size doesn't fit all at the CSU when it comes to things like this. But uh, for the 
21 campuses on semesters, uh, they have been given, as have the two quarter campuses, been given great flexibility for them to decide what's best for their students. So for example, uh, some places may very well choose to say, okay, student X, you've earned a B. Uh, do you wanna get the B or do you wanna get a pass grade? Um, or student, student Y, you've earned a C minus, do you wanna get a P or, or a credit rather? We don't use pass, non-pass, we use credit, non-credit. Or do you wanna get a credit grade or do you wanna get your C minus? Now, sometimes the students who are interested in going on to graduate school um, or professional school will find that they would prefer to have the letter grade because those typically become factors in admission into graduate and professional schools. And others are gonna be much more satisfied with having recognition that they got credit for their, for their effort, but don't care so much about the grade. So we've created a policy that's flexible and that interacts around the sequence of courses that they're in, uh, uh, as well as the student's interest in the discipline that they're in. So you know, Berkeley's uh, pass, non-pass was a student choice. I mean, they could decide. Uh, University of Oregon has done the same thing. Notre Dame did the same thing. Uh, here's, your, here's, your, here's your grade that you've earned this, this term. Uh, do you want to have that letter grade or do you want to have a, a credit or no, a grade or a pass grade instead? Uh, so I think that's where we're going. Um, and, and I'm pleased about that because I don't, again, want these artificial barriers to hurt students in the short term or in the long term. And then admissions. UC just announced that they are waiving SAT and ACT testing at the requirements for students applying for fall uh, 2021. Uh, will CFU do the same? And uh, what changes are you making to admissions, if any at all? Yeah, so we we are, uh, our admissions policy is analogous but different than the UC's, our admissions uh, process rather. And there's a one stop, one application uh, that we process about 1.4 million applications uh, in one stop and then for they get formed out to the various campuses. For, uh, so let's be, let's be clear, uh, the SAT and the ACT are not being administered now. Um, so there's no way that we're going to hold our students uh, responsible for not taking those exams uh, because when they're not available, it's not the student's fault. So we are engaged with our academic senate as we speak uh, and with the academic leaders of campuses to make a revision of our admissions policy for the fall of 21. Uh, so for students that are juniors this year for their admission in the fall of 21. Uh, we don't actually require the ACT or SAT tests. We never have for students who have a grade point of 3.0 or above. And we've only required it for students who have a high school grade point below 3.0. And there's then as, the, as campuses do a, an evaluation of a student, you know, they may have done horribly poorly with their grades and knock the socks off on these standardized tests and find their way into the university. And so the standardized tests, despite all of the concerns about them, have actually made a difference for almost 18,000 students every year getting into the CSU because they've been a counterbalance to lousy grades that may have occurred because of something that they stubbed their toe on academically or something happened in their life or their family. So we're trying to figure out a way that's fair to the top 33% of the students in California's high school who we're responsible for bringing into the university in the absence of having these standardized tests available for the fall of 21. And so we will be announcing that within a week or two is exactly how we're gonna go forward. But do have the comfort that there's gonna be an accommodation for this circumstance. We also have been using uh, the uh, smarter balanced standardized test for placement of students into, into uh, English and mathematics classes. And that statewide test is not being administered this year so we're not going to be able to be using that as well. So we just have to look at all the moving parts, come up with a fair and reasoned approach to evaluate students' readiness to be a university student. We are committed to bringing them in if they are. And when they get to us, we are committed to having them succeed. Uh, but we have a little bit more work to do on the technical side, and we'll be announcing that publicly. For the fall of 20, of course, those admissions have all been done already. and uh, 
uh, and so the students will be getting notified. And again, we're not going to use any of the short-term interruptions uh, get in the way. We're going to be relaxing deadlines for uh, uh, making the admission decisions wherever we can. We're going to be relaxing due dates for uh, payment of, uh, of, of fees for housing and uh, assuming we have housing in the fall, that's still probably an open question and see where we are with respect to, uh, to this virus uh, pandemic. So you mentioned those deadlines for committing to a campus and submitting deposits. I know some CSU campuses have pushed those deadlines back uh, to June 1st. Why hasn't that happened on a system-wide level? Um, to be honest, I don't know. <laughs> it's probably one of the ones that hasn't made it to to the to my level of conversations. We've been focusing elsewhere. I, I think sometimes, I mean, I would also say that that you know, one size does not fit all in the in the CESU doesn't fit one size doesn't fit all in the University of California nor the California Community College. So uh, there may be some variation in the dates historically. Uh, uh, campuses have had the wherewithal to focus on that. So that's something that we'll have to come back and, and make sure is both fair, but also appropriate uh, with respect to making decisions of who's going to be here so we can uh, uh, prepare for the next class of students, both coming out of high schools, but also transferring in from the community colleges. I just want to remind folks that we are taking questions in the chat. Please send them to us. Um, one that we've gotten is whether CSU will be repackaging financial aid officer offers for students whose finances might have changed as a result of COVID-19. Yeah, so our financial aid offices are open, they're open virtually, and you bet anytime there is a change in family income or a student's income, depending on their uh, tax status, uh, that's all fair game to go back in and have your financial aid package uh, reevaluated and reconsidered. Um, you know, some students are at the maximum awards through Cal Grant or the State University Grant and Pell and others have room to go up. So I would encourage anybody whose finances have changed to get a hold of financial aid on your campus and, and, and start that process of reevaluation. So there's been some talk about using university buildings as healthcare facilities for coronavirus patients as some campuses are, are emptying out. Um, we know at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, they have converted a gym into a medical clinic or are in the process of doing that. Are any other campuses doing this? Um, and if so, how will those buildings be used and, and how do you ensure that the students still living on campus are kept safe? Yeah, it's really an important question. And it's sort of interesting, again, to step back to the higher level for a moment. You know, we are Californians. And we share, each of us individually and all of us collectively and as a university, we share uh, a responsibility, in my judgment, uh, to help solve this statewide, national, global pandemic. So if we have facilities that can be used for helping flatten the curve in California or taking care of individuals by decompressing hospitals with, with ambulatory non-critical care patients and have them go over to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo's Recreation Center in a tented, internally tented medical facility with proper distancing inside there, et cetera, that then relieves the hospitals for the acute COVID cases then we are doing our part as a member of community. And we have this, these conversations going on actually on eight, maybe nine campuses right now. At Fresno State, for example, they have a new agricultural research and science building that just came online recently. And one of the new state-of-the-art laboratories has not yet been used for instruction. It was planning to be used in the fall. The county health department now has moved their equipment in there. It's the only COVID-19 testing facility in the Fresno region. And that was an arrangement worked out between President Castro and the local emergency health officials in Fresno. We have similar things going on here in Long Beach uh, with respect to the emergency operations health people thinking about uh, one of our uh, remote uh, housing facilities along the Pacific Coast Highway uh, to 
relocate all the students who live, who are currently living there elsewhere to other residence halls, freeing up that remote building for again, care for non-ambulatory, non-acute patients, not COVID-19 as we speak now. Um, there are uh, other conversations going along people that have large arenas and or parking lots where people can do drive-by testing and things of that nature. So I think the, the point that I would like to make is that all of our campuses have, uh, are, are amenable to local districts, health districts and emergency operations centers connecting them. We have set up centrally here a um, facilities responsiveness team it's made up of uh, very, very capable four or five people. Uh, the administrative lead on that is Brad Wells, who's phenomenally good at this job. And when we get an inquiry here, we also connect with Governor Newsom's Emergency Operations Center. So they also, the state knows our inventory of potential beds in emptied out residence halls. Um, if we give them away locally, then they come out of the state inventory so we don't get clumsy as a state, this is a huge management problem. We've got it figured out. Now, embedded in your question was how do we make sure we don't put existing students at risk? We're not going to put somebody who may be a carrier or who's known to be a carrier in a residence hall room next to somebody, one of our students. And so we have to find a way to move existing students into other buildings or other floors uh, have different ways of egress and ingress into the buildings for those who may be carriers. Uh, all of those considerations go into place. But if at the end of the day, we can't work something out, uh, then we're not going to be able to agree to something. But there are MOUs that have all the legal stuff and the responsibility of who's going to pay for this, who's going to pay for the alterations. And at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, um, how are we going to do that? genuine deep sanitation of those facilities. So in the future, when students and employees come back into the spaces, we know that it's been void of any, any of the virus. Uh, a lot, a lot of stuff going on. Um, committed to community, but mindful of our first commitment to our students and our employees. This next one is a uh, question from the audience. Uh, Kevin Cook uh, pointed out that in past few sessions, the California State University has had to raise tuition. Um, are you looking at that possibility? No, not at the moment. Um, certainly, you know, we we uh, we did we, every year we go through because of the uh, legislation, a law that requires called the uh, uh, Family uh, Working Family Transparency Act. It requires us every year to engage our students starting sort of in October with a conversation about you know, if all heck breaks loose with our state appropriation, what kind of tuition increase might we consider to make up for that? So we've engaged that conversation every year since that law was passed. And that law was passed in response to the recession of 2008-2009. This year, we have started that conversation uh, in, in October but we pulled it uh, in March uh, because as we saw this uncertainty coming and the economic impact on students and families. The last thing that we wanted to do was have the worry of an increase in tuition be one other thing that they were thinking about financially. So we're not raising tuition this year and we don't plan to raise it next year. Um, and I think we also have to have some assurance from the state of California of sustaining our operations with state appropriation. If the state's unable to do that, then it totally changes the conversation. We have to reopen that whole issue around tuition going forward, or we have to get much smaller, or we have to lower the quality of the education. And, and I think California knows that the CSU in particular is the largest engine of the workforce of the future than anybody else. And so to disinvest or to cut down our ability to teach Californians to become productive members of the of the economy is something that's not in California's best interest. So I think our mission will keep us in a place where we remain reasonably well funded, even though it'll be hard and tight uh, for a period of time. Looking forward to the fall semester, what kinds of contingency plans is the university putting in place 
in case we are still socially distancing then? Yeah, wonderful question. I think I would ask the, the questioner to say, what about the summer? <laughs> because, you know, we, you know, we are uh, sequential beasts. And so we've been spending a lot of time, uh, how do we end up this academic year and this huge, huge pivot to using technology assisted learning uh, has been really remarkable. But then we're starting to think now, what about the and different campuses call them different things, but I'm just gonna call them summer sessions, summer spring half terms or summer half terms or in between terms and all kind crazy number of ways we describe this stuff. So how are we gonna do that education in the summertime? And now we're just turning our attention to the what ifs for the fall. And and I think you know goes back to an earlier question about, you know, I'm I'm having trouble doing my three hour class online, is we're gonna learn so much over the next couple of months of this academic year into the summer, but that'll help refine how we do our planning for the fall. But we would be um, we would be foolish not to be considering in the fall that we're going to continue being in a largely virtual state. It'd be better to plan in that direction, it seems to me, uh, and then be able to pull back from that and to cross our fingers and hope, oh my God, I just hope this is over by fall, but I don't know what I'm going to do. That would not be a responsible way for our campuses to go forward. So in that conversation, you know, I meet daily with our presidents by Zoom and twice daily with the vice chancellors by Zoom. And we've talked already for the last week and a half, two weeks about how to plan for the summer and for the fall. And so from the concept of what I just said of planning to be highly dependent on the virtual experience, if not totally dependent on it, to something less than that is the way the planning is going on. Is there something to pronounce publicly that this is what it's going to look like today? The answer is no. But do have the comfort knowing that that level of planning and thinking is going on both in the administrators, but also, quite frankly, in the academic senate and the faculty leaders and down to the department levels and the individual faculty members. Uh, I, I am deeply impressed with the resilience and the can-do attitude of the you know, we're a we're a half of half of you know we're 500 million people when you think about I mean 500,000 people not 500 million 500,000 people mm -hmm. half of of students and faculty and staff and people are committed to finding a way through this and without that we would be stuck in the stuck in the mud. Last question before we wrap up, um, a student journalist at Sacramento State sent this in. What can we be learned from the crash of 2008 as we start to prepare students to enter an economy that may very well be in a tailspin when they graduate? Well, one thing is that no matter what the economy is or what the politics are, nobody can take away the value of a college degree. And so if you look in the most recent recession, but you look at other recessions that weren't quite as dramatic in the 90s and, and uh, early 2000s, and then again, the 2008, the big crash in, in our lifetimes, that those who had a college degree at any rate of unemployment, if you had a college degree, you were half what the average was. And at any employment place, you were earning more money than what the college was, those without a college degree. So I think the one lesson is, is, is persevere, is be resilient, is by, by hook or by crook, do everything in your power as an individual student and as an individual faculty member to deliver that instruction to help our students achieve. And I go back to my opening line is, is we are committed to that inclusive excellence and student achievement and success. That's one lesson. I think the second lesson is is there is no entitlement. There is no there is no free lunch here. And we're all going to be hurt in some degree financially by this, uh, this epidemic, both in the costs of managing through it and the reduced revenues that come from uh, family incomes and uh, government programs. So plan on a little bit of pain, uh, but don't give up on the goals. And I think maybe that's kind of, and, and that we're, we actually share in this together, that we all collectively should band together 
and work our way to, through together as a university community uh, and a California community. Because as the governor often says, it's California for all. Well, that's in both good times and bad times. And we're going into a rough patch. And finally, I would say, uh, unlike the recession of the past, is there are these genuine health concerns. And so be part of the solution by doing the physical distancing, so-called social distancing, but it's really physical distancing. And do your part in not transmitting this disease, especially during these next three or four weeks, as tough as it is uh, uh, being away from friends and, and uh, campuses. We, we bear a responsibility in doing that. So maybe that's my, my three things to say, um, uh, Felicia, uh, to that really important question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your time today. My pleasure. And thank you, thank all three of you, Aiden, Felicia, and Chancellor White, for having a great conversation and to the audience for asking great questions. Please keep them coming in because they are useful for the reporters who'd be following up. They turn into good stories. And also we can send them along to the Chancellor and his team to follow up on as well. So uh, if you have any other extra questions, please send them in to us. Our email is info at calmatters.org. If you miss any of this discussion, if you came in a little later, you can watch it again. You can also listen to it later. The video is going to be living here live on this YouTube channel. It's also available at calmatters.org. We are creating an audio podcast, like I said. That's also available to link to at calmatters.org. And we do have a podcast hub at soundcloud.com slash calmatters. We're reporting on all things coronavirus all around the clock. So for all our coverage about the outbreak in California, including our new college-focused blog, Corona on Campus, visit calmatters.org slash coronavirus and subscribe to our newsletters at calmatters.org slash subscribe. And again, if you're able to support our nonprofit, nonpartisan civics on steroids journalism at this time, please make a donation via our homepage at calmatters.org. Those websites uh, that I gave you are the places you can stay tuned for our upcoming series, Getting Through Coronavirus Explained. We have another one coming up next week, Tuesday, this Tuesday, April 7th at 1 p.m. It'll be all about mental health. And we'll be talking with California mental experts about the strategies and tips about how to take care of your mental health and get through this pandemic in a good state of mind. In the meantime, stay strong, stay healthy, stay safe. Thank you again for joining us and we will see you next time.